It's five weeks since we planted our leafy greens, three weeks since we planted our fruiting vegetables, and with all the beautiful sunshine we've had, the great soil preparation we put in, and the watering that we've had from the people here, plus the rain we've got, everything's looking fantastic. The carrots and beetroot are growing beautifully. We did an initial thin two weeks ago. It's simply a matter of gently pulling the carrots out. The beetroot seedlings can be transplanted, so we put a few in some bare spots. Today they need another thin, so just work out how big the carrot and the beetroot is going to be when they're mature and space accordingly. You can leave them a bit thicker than that though and wait until they're baby vegetable size. Then eat those small and leave the others to mature fully. The strawberries are starting to fruit, so it's time to mulch them and cover with netting. Before we put the bird netting on, we're going to be putting some straw on this bed to keep the moisture in and to keep the fruit clean. Irie, can I have the bird netting please? <laughs> Thank you. The vegetables here at Pascal and Hunters are looking amazing. Everything's grown so well. Our aim is to produce the most healthy vegetables possible for two reasons. Firstly, our health. Secondly, the more healthy the vegetables, the less likely pests and diseases are to attack the plants. Pests and diseases strike weak and struggling plants. That's why we keep the fertilizing up. Our plants have enough fertilizer at the moment, but in a few weeks, we'll show you how to make a liquid fertilizer. Come on guys, it's raining, let's do this quick. Time to enjoy some of our produce. Right, we'll do one more, another big cut. Right guys, over the side. All right, all right, you hold on to that leaf, I'm gonna cut it. Fingers out of the way, cut. Cool. <laughs> Good, couple more leaves. Ari, right, you take those, put them on the plate. Now it's three weeks since we were last here, and as you can see, we really need to get stuck into this garden. Now the tomatoes need delateraling, which means we're going to strip out a lot of the smaller branches, so we end up with just two or three strong shoots, which will give us a strong support for some great fruit up here. It also means removing a lot of these leaves around the bottom, which means we're getting good air movement, which means good hygiene and a lower risk of diseases. We've identified two strong stems that we're going to keep, this nice vertical branch here, and what was the original main stem. Normally we would actually just snap the branches just with an up and down movement because it leaves a nice natural wound that heals well. I'm also going to start removing some of the leaves. Remember we want to open this up to get good air movement in and it's the same up and down movement until you get a snap. I'm just taking the little side shoots off and some of the smaller leaves just so we get a good clear line of sight to see what main branches we might need to remove. So at this point it won't snap off, so we need to use either a secateurs or a knife. The critical thing here though, is to make sure that they're actually clean, and what we recommend is just methylated spirits. It'll wipe any bugs, disease off the knife or off the secateurs. It's important not to put the cuttings into your worm bin or your compost bin, as leaves of the tomato or the solanum family in large quantities may be toxic. By removing all of the lower leaves and some of these branches, we're actually exposing some of the fruit as it forms, which means that we're also bringing a lot of sunshine onto the fruit as it ripens. Now we're pretty much there with a good strong shape. We've got our one, two liters. We've decided to keep this one as well. It gives us three nice stems here, fruit forming already, so it's looking really good. And lastly, we can remove some of these laterals that are coming out of the crooks of the leaf joints. 
So but just simply pinching those out and that's something you can do just on a regular basis. It's important when you're tying up any of your vegetables, especially tomatoes or say cucumbers, to use a very soft tie. Nice stretchy one is ideal. Now we'll work on the cherry tomato. For this one we've identified two good strong branches. This nice one here and one at the back here which will give us good upright growth. Even though this is a nice strong branch, we've actually made an executive decision to get rid of it. It's going to interfere with the tomato beside it and it's also coming in very, very low, so we don't want that. In pulling a lot of the growth away from the base, we've identified another branch, which is actually nice and strong, so we're going to keep it. That's why it's important to take your time as you snap things off. Ideally, delateraling should take place on a dry, windy day, as humidity can cause fungal infection. Applying flowers of sulphur with a paintbrush on freshly made wounds will help seal them. Another way to prevent a fungal disease called blight is to actually water your tomatoes in the morning so they get a chance to dry off through the day. Watering at night causes a lot of humidity and the fungus will just kick in. Now the bok choy is all eaten up, we have some new seedlings here ready to plant. So the bok choy, we've actually taken some of the soil away when we've pulled the old plants out. So before we plant, we need to do a bit of a top up. Come on kids, come on, let's do some planting. We add sheep pellets to our soil as the previous crop will have used up some of the nutrients. That's it, just to put just a few in there and we'll pop one of these plants out ready for planting. Okay, cover it over, firm it back. Right there where my finger is. Well done Ari, good drink for every plant. The cos and iceberg lettuces at Pascal and Hunters are eaten. And this time we're planting loose leaf ones which handle summer heat better and manage being harvested leaf by leaf. But these look like crowns. They do. This time without the wrapper. Here you go Hunter. I'll give you one of these lettuces to plant. Look at that. Look at the colour of that one. Brilliant uh, colour. And also heaps of roots. So you remember how to plant it? That's it. In and then. Good boy. Well done. Oh, we'll do another colour this time. Look at the colour of that one. That's going to make a nice salad. It looks like nice white. Bright. It looks like white still, but it's not. That's it. Put it in. You remember what to do. Good man. There was, we go. That was really satisfying. <laughs> right, we'll just top up with a little bit of extra soil around just to cover those roots. So remember, we always have to water them in. That settles all the potting mix around the roots and gets the plants off to a Not good quick start. Do well done, Hunter. Now you need to get in the habit of sowing seeds in advance, so you have seedlings ready when you need them. The best way to work this out is to know how many lettuces you would eat in a week. So say if Pascal's family would eat one whole lettuce a week, then we need to sow three seeds every three weeks, or two every two, and so on. At Chantal and Clinton's, they reckon they'll eat four bok choy a week and one lettuce, so that's what they're sowing. You don't have to sow every week, but around every two to three weeks, so you keep the supply up. Now it looks like we've had a bit of sunburn on the beans. We can tell just from the marking on here. We know it's sunburn because all the new growths come, actually come out quite clean, so the plant's adapting to the heat. This is a really hot little courtyard. We also notice that we've actually got some leaves missing up here, and on a previous visit to check, we did find a snail around in this area, which we've managed to kill. So we need to be very vigilant on slugs and snails from here on in. Now to deal with slugs and snails, we're going to create a yeast trap, which uses the bottom of our plastic bottles that we created the funnels with. So we've kept the bottoms and we're going to create the yeast trap just using some simple ingredients, a cup of warm water, a teaspoon of yeast, and a teaspoon of sugar. And then we're going to mix all that together, wait for it to froth up, and then we can actually put it into the trap and put it into the garden. So we're going to put our yeast trap into the bean bag and what we do is we set it just in a small hollow just so it's just above soil levels. We don't want the soil to actually fall in and fill it up. Now it's the yeasty smell that attracts the slugs and snails and this trap is particularly good at attracting slugs. The companion plants for the tomato here at Pascal's which are the basil and the marigold are all doing really well. If leafy greens aren't used, they'll go to seed, as they think their usefulness is over and they need to reproduce themselves. So it's important to constantly pick your plants to keep them growing. 
Now, as much as we love the sun, it can dry our containers out. So it's a good idea, as we did with the strawberries, to mulch our gardens. Straw is good if you can get it, otherwise we like this coconut product, which you just add water to and it expands and covers the soil nicely. It's a good natural product from a sustainable source. Our hungry bin worm farms do best in a cool area, which we don't really have at either of our properties. So we've decided to hang some shade cloth over them. When we set the planters up originally, we added a lot of dry fertiliser in the form of sheep pellets, chicken manure and the rock dust. That gave the plants a really good kick to start with. Ongoing, we need to actually liquid feed. It's critical that we do that to get the best crops possible. Now today we're actually using sheep pellets and we're just putting in three decent handfuls into our bucket. To our three handfuls of sheep pellets, we're going to add about eight litres of water. You could also use chicken manure or vermicast from the worm farm instead of sheep pellets. After about four days, you're going to end up with a very dark liquid fertiliser looking like tea. At that point, use your watering can, 50% water, 50% liquid tea, and just put it over the tops of all your vegetables and around your plants. After a period of time, you're going to end up with the sludge at the bottom. You've used all the water. That sludge is also nutritious, so that gets put into your planters as well, just buried in under the soil. Another liquid fertilizer that makes a huge difference to tomatoes and potatoes is comfrey. Now comfrey is actually a foliar fertilizer, which means the leaves absorb the nutrients. We have a commercial blend here, but if you do have access to comfrey, it's easy to make up a brew the same way as we did with the sheep pellets and apply. Layla's garden is coming along nicely too. The eggplant is just stunning, and we've got beautiful cucumbers coming on the cucumber vine. The lettuce, Layla tells me she's going to start picking tonight for a dinner party. And it looks like we just need to do a little bit of staking with the capsicum and tie up the cucumber along the edge of the railing. So next time we'll see our fruiting plants producing and we'll start planning our winter gardens.